The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, fifth chapter, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This morning I want to speak to you from the first reading. Oh, it's only short, so I'll just read it again so it's fresh in your mind. 1 John 3, 1-3 How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we ask you to indeed draw us near to you as we hear this word. Assure us of your love and the future certainty that your love brings us. So bless our hearing of the word and our living of it. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. It was on the 13th of November, 1789, that the USA founding father, Benjamin Franklin, wrote what was probably his greatest last quote, a saying about the Constitution of the USA and life that became true for him five months later. In November 1789, Franklin wrote a French scientist, Jean-Baptiste Leroy, concerned that he hadn't heard from Leroy since the start of the French Revolution. Franklin wrote in French, and that was later translated into English for the publication of his correspondence. After asking Leroy about his health and events in Paris for the last year, Franklin gives a quick update about the major event in the USA. That was the establishing of the Constitution and the start of the new government, which came as a result of that Constitution. And this is what he wrote. Our new Constitution is now established. Everything seems to promise it will be durable, but in this world nothing is certain except death and taxes. He concluded with a note about his own mortality to his friend. He said, My health continues much as it has been for some time, except that I grow thinner and weaker, so that I cannot expect to hold out much longer. And Franklin would uh, succumb to a combination of illnesses at the age of 84 in Philadelphia on April the 17th, 1790. 
There are two certainties in life, death and taxes. I'm sure that you've heard this saying before. But for those of us who are saints, who are children of God, there is another certainty for us in the future beyond death. And it is a certainty that impacts the way that we live life now. And it comes as a result of being loved by God and by following his son, Jesus Christ. Today on this All Saints Day, I want to speak to you on the theme of the future certainty of following Christ. Now today we celebrate All Saints Day and the Roman Catholic Church from which the tradition of All Saints arises. All Saints Day is celebrated on November the 1st and it is a day in which we, they remember the saints of the church, both known and unknown. Saints are those people who have lived exemplary Christian lives and are an example of the faith. They are also officially recognised by the church as being in heaven. And so it's a time to reflect on the lives of the saints and to be inspired by their example. All Souls Day is celebrated on November the 2nd. It's a day to pray for all the souls of the faithful departed, especially those who are believed to be in purgatory. Purgatory is a state of purification that Roman Catholics believe that souls go through to be purged of sin before their final entrance into heaven. When we celebrate All Saints Day in the Protestant Church, we remember saints who have been exemplary members of the Christian faith. But we also remember all the ordinary saints who are in heaven and who live on the earth. Saints like you and me. We also remember at this time loved ones who have died and we reflect on the meaning of life and death. Now one thing that exemplary saints and ordinary saints have in common is the way that they become saints. How great is the love that the Father has lavished upon us. No one becomes a saint <coughs> except by the great, magnificent, enormous love of God the Father, the first person of the Trinity. Without that love, nobody would be able to become a saint, no matter how wonderful the good works they do in this life. When John wrote, how great is the love of the Father, the meaning of the original Greek is, of what country? Of what country is the love of the Father? The kind of love the Father expresses for us is so unearthly, so foreign to this world. John wonders what country it might come from. In fact, what we might say today, what planet it might come from. Why is this? Well, it's because of the way the love was shown. According to John, the depth and fullness of God's love for us was shown when he sent Jesus Christ to suffer and die for us on the cross. When we look at the cross, there we see the depths of the divine heart of love of God. And this love does not shrink from sacrifice, but gives all so that we might have all. This love is evoked by no lovableness of our own. Our sin made us completely repulsive in the sight of God. But his love comes to us because of his own infinite being. He loves us because of he must and because of who he is as love and because of who he is as God. It's a love that will not be put off by sinfulness, shortcomings and evil. And he pours it out as treasure onto the unworthy, like sunshine onto a pile of manure.
How great is the love the Father has lavished upon us. It is stronger than death and sin. It is more powerful than any other force in the universe. It is so lavish that it is beyond measuring. It is totally out of this world. Nothing like it is found in all of creation. It is totally transcendent. And as a result of this love that is lavished upon us, we are called children of God. There's only one natural child of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, but through his death on the cross, we become children of God. We share in his sonship. We are adopted into the family of the Heavenly Father. We go through a transformation. It is how we are made children of God, how we are made saints. You know, in the Roman world, adoption took place, but it was not about <clears throat> compassion for orphans. In fact, many people were adopted as young adults or as adults. Adoption came about because of inheritance and name. Often a man was adopted to carry on the name of a childless family. The adopted son would sever ties with his old family. And this would include relief from any debt that was owed under the name of the old family. He would become a whole new person in a whole new world with a new inheritance and a new name. And so it is with our spiritual adoption through Jesus Christ. John's vision is not just about the past having a clean slate or about the distant future going to heaven, but about today and tomorrow. You know, redemption is false if it's not transformative into righteousness right now. Sin cannot be explained away, ignored or excused. Christ came to deal with sin and abiding in him and entering into the family of God through Christ's own sonship is the only way that we can sever bondage to sin. So how are we adopted into the family of God? How do we become God's children? It is by the sacrament of baptism when we receive the forgiveness of sins, the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to live a life as a disciple of Christ, and the promise of a place in the new creation when all things will be made new in the future. Those blessings come to us as God's children. Through all the blessings of the cross, come to us in holy baptism. And that is what we are, God's children, and these blessings are our certainties. But living as children of God will not be easy. John writes, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And Jesus himself said this in John 18, uh, sorry, 15, 18 and 19. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. And because God loves us as his children, we are at enmity with the world. If the world says hate, we say, we say love. If the world says power, we say service. If the world says greed, we say generosity. If the world says revenge, we say forgive. If the world says denigrate, we say encourage. Living out of the love of God is not easy. That is a certainty. It was the same for Jesus, it's the same for us, for all who have followed him throughout the ages and it makes us foreigners in this world. So John reiterates to his readers again, Dear friends, now we are children of God. We march to the beat of a different drum compared with the children of the world. We are children of God, not children of the world. And because 
we are children of God, we are saints, we are holy, not in the sense of perfection, but in the sense of being set aside for God, for his purpose and mission. That is what being a saint is all about in this world. There's nothing obviously different about us. As St. Paul says in Colossians 3.3, 3, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. We take our cue for life from a different source than the world does. And what the final product of the lavishing of God's love upon us will look like, we are not sure. John writes, what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So when Christ returns, the inner working of his love will be complete. It will have visible expression. And what that exactly means for us, we don't know. But we will not be fat little cherubs wearing a nappy, flying around heaven with a bow and arrow. Nor we will be angels sitting on clouds playing our harp. Nor does it mean, as some Christians believe, that we will be 33, because that is the supposed age Jesus was when he suffered and died and rose again. But what it does mean is that the journey will be complete. The work of the Spirit will be finished and the fullness of who we are as children of God will reach its culmination. And what that means is when Christ returns, we will look at him and we will look down at ourselves and we'll see that we are like him, children of God as he is a child of God. You know, it won't be long until we sing that wonderful Christmas carol with the words, and our, our eyes at last shall see him through his own redeeming love. You know, if we have any love for Jesus, any longing right now, it ought to be that we will come face to face with him at last to see his smile, to gaze on his facial expression and begin to know him in a whole new way. This final vision of Christ is our future certainty of having lived a life of being loved by God and following his son, Jesus. John writes, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Christ-likeness is our ultimate destiny, our ultimate future, our future certainty. And as far as God is concerned, we are already perfect. So we strive to purify ourselves, strive to be who we are, strive to live according to God's will and not the world's will. And this is our natural response to being in a loving relationship with God. God is pure, so we seek to live in purity, avoiding sin and seeking to live the righteous life. Now John knows we're not perfect yet, we still sin, we will still fail, but the failures must take place in a settled habit of life where sin is not setting the tone. Remember, we're marching to the beat of a different drum now. Even if we stumble and fall, that does not mean that we're going to get back up and march to a different tune. One who is loved by God is always attracted to the love of God, even when we stumble and sin. By the power of the same Holy Spirit that descended upon Jesus Christ at his baptism, we are growing into the likeness of the fullness of a child of God. God's lavish love is changing us day by day as we live in relationship with God. Finally, one day when Christ returns, just as an old building that is renovated behind Hessian covering 
When the covering comes down, it's bright and shiny and brand new. So it will be when the Hessian covering of our lives is taken down at the end when Christ returns, something bright, shiny and new will be on display. And that is a fully formed child of God, a saint in the image of Christ. Amen. So Lord, we thank you that on this All Saints Day we celebrate the wonderful future certainty that we have because of your lavish love for us that was shown to us in Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to live the life of a saint. Help us, O oh God, to always make those decisions in favour of righteousness, in favour of your love. So, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit given us in our baptism, continue to lead and guide and bless us on our way until we see you face to face and behold your smile in heaven. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.